Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is our third uh, webinar, the Greater St. Louis Business Aviation Association webinar, and we're very pleased to uh, welcome as our um, presenters today, uh, Ed Thomas, Sales Director of the Midwest for Bombardier Aircraft, new aircraft. Uh, he's also with Jonathan Headley, he's Sales Director uh, corporate fleets as well as the Midwest new aircraft. Uh, we also have uh, Matt St. Sire, who is the uh, sales engineering manager from Bombardier. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Tim, uh, the Gieselbar president, cannot make it today. Uh, however, the only announcement that we have is you probably got the uh, the news that the trivia night uh, uh, would be canceled due to COVID, but the uh, golf tournament is still planning to move ahead. That'll be uh, September 23rd at Old Hickory Country Club. Uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, make that event happen. Um, also coming up in September, we're going to have a, uh, uh, a very interesting um, webinar. Uh, it'll be, I'm hoping it's gonna be part of the WINGS program so you get credit for it as well. But uh, the Greater St. Louis Flight Instructors Association, uh, uh, along with several of the um, uh, leading lights within the uh, educational community, are actually gonna do a presentation on uh, airport operations. So uh, we haven't, uh, scheduled the August webinar yet, but we will very soon. Uh, so without much further ado, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Ed Thomas. Uh, take it away, Ed. Thank you, Jeremy, and, and thank you to the St. Louis Business Aircraft Association for giving us this opportunity this afternoon. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge a couple of other of our team members who are are logged on as well. Mark Servinsky, who handles the, the Learjet product line for St. Louis. Zach Wachholz, who handles our pre-owned uh, business, as well as Aaron Chrysler, who is our manager of service sales. Uh, all of us are the, the team that covers the St. Louis area. So again, thanks for, for the opportunity and uh, I'll kick it over to Jonathan uh, to get going. Thanks, Ed. I uh, hope everyone's doing well on this Friday afternoon. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're uh, doing here at Bombardier before we let Matt start off with the uh, presentations. Um, I'm sure most of you all are very familiar with Ed and his background with Bombardier being here a long time and uh, obviously in the Midwest also. But uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm the, I'm the new guy in the Bombardier team. Um, a career pilot started flying when I was uh, in high school, did everything from flight instruction, flew for AirNet, uh, airlines and corporations. Um, ended up at uh, Gulfstream for 10 years as an OEM uh, uh, production test demo captain and also their safety manager. Um, so I was uh, given the opportunity to come over and uh, try sales at Bombardier about two years ago when um, our senior leadership decided that uh, we needed to have a specialty group for corporate fleets. So just for everyone's education on this, what qualifies for a corporate fleet would be uh, three jet aircraft or more, and they would also be considered competitive takeaways. So I do not call on existing fleet customers of, uh, of ours. And I do, uh, on top of that, I do handle our NetJets account. So um, again, uh, thank you so much for the, uh, for the invite guys, Jeremy, and uh, obviously the association. We're excited to be here. Uh, we, we, we decided uh, going through uh, talking with Matt and the guys, we decided to do a little background on Bombardier if you're not familiar with the company as a whole, there are a lot of changes recently. Uh, so we're going to do a little background history. We're going to talk a little bit about what we offer right now as far as our platforms and then go into a deep dive on the 7500. So um, we, uh, we encourage uh, you know, participation here. If there's anything we're not talking about or anything we need to be a little bit more clear on or uh, just something we just didn't mention or anything you have a question about, please do not uh, be afraid to uh, break in or either type a question or if you wanted to uh, ask us, uh, that would be ideal for us just to kind of keep the flow going. Um, 
All right, without further ado, um, we've got Matthew St. Cyr, who is our sales engineering manager for Bombardier. He's our guru, uh, one of the best in the business. So um, I don't know how long he's been here. I think it's probably been over 15 at least, uh, possible uh, 15 years with the company. So without further ado, uh, Matthew St. Cyr is going to take it away and start off with uh, our presentation. Matt? Matt, we don't have any audio from you. I think I muted myself pressing there the you button. Go. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, name is Matt Saint Cyr. I've uh, been with Bombardier with uh, 20 years. So uh, thanks, Jonathan, for the overdone presentation. Uh, I'd like to recognize the Blues winning the Stanley Cup. I'm a big hockey fan. Um, I could not put a background of Boston in the back, but Blues is fine. And, you know, Congratulations for your win. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let me try that. All right. Can we see my screen? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. we're Thank good. You. All right. Uh, so we, as Jonathan said, we thought we'd do a little introduction on the Global 7500 aircraft. Um, it's our most recent product. Uh, it's a fantastic design. And we thought we'd share a bit with you a couple of the highlights of that, you know, wonderful plane. It's been 10 years in the making uh, for us at Bombardier. So like, air, you know, doing an airplane design like this takes a long time, a lot of efforts and, you know, you need to think about everything. So um, we, I think the team did a fantastic job. Just want to highlight a couple of the highlights for this. As Jonathan was saying, I, I suggest we start with just a little bit of a, a history of Bombardier. Um, so uh, Mr. Bombardier, our name comes from our founder, Mr. Bombardier, who uh, actually invented the snowmobile. Uh, so Mr. Bombardier was uh, an inventor. Uh, he actually had like very little education, but he started working in his father's garage. So he had access to tools. And he always had like new ideas coming up. One of his ideas was to do a, a vehicle that's propelled on snow. Uh, putting ourselves back into the 1940s, the, like the, the, the government would not plow the streets in the rural Quebec. So people were stranded home uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and actually one tragic incident happened where, uh, you know, Mr. Bombardier uh, lost one of his sons so uh, because they couldn't get him to the hospital in time. So after that, he dev dev devoted all his might to developing a snowmobile. Uh, he did make a lot of progress from his initial design, which was a propeller-driven snowmobile. If you can imagine how dangerous that thing was. If you can't, it looked exactly like this. Uh, so he basically built that. That's a Ford Model T engine that he strapped a propeller behind on skis, toured around the village. His father heard about it, ordered him to dismantle the thing right away because it was, <laughs> if you can imagine how dangerous that thing was running around the village. Uh, and after that, he came up with the sprocket design with that, uh, you know, that became the, the, uh, the, 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 the logo of Bombardier after. Uh, Mr. Bombardier at some point uh, gave the, the uh, lead of his company to his son-in-law, Mr. Laurent Baudouin, uh, who Laurent Baudouin was a real entrepreneur. So he actually diversified the company uh, from building ski doos and, and, and snowmobiles to the train business. Uh, so you can see that the New York uh, subway uh, here is a Bombardier product. Uh, it was manufactured by Bombardier. So that was the first venture into the diversification of Bombardier. Uh, so a lot of the rail equipment in the world is, was actually, is actually manufactured by Bombardier, was one of our products. Uh, and then Laurent Baudouin also diversified the company one more time when, uh, with the acquisition of Canadair in 1986 from the Canadian government. Um, 
and you know we we had one product at the time which was you know the challenger uh, the water bomber also uh, so it, it started and bombardier's aerospace sector was actually built around acquisition so the acquisition of canada the acquisition of short brothers in ireland which is the oldest aviation company in the world uh, the acquisition of Learjet in 1990 and de Havilland in 1992. Uh, so this is where Bombardier's aerospace sector, uh, how it was formed. Um, and now Bombardier is like really centered on business aircraft. We're like, re like all of our uh, manufacturing is, is, you know, all geared around business aircraft. Uh, because we have a, a, like a, an excellent uh, portfolio of product in the business aircraft. Our revenues are like were $7.5 billion last year. Uh, this is uh, increasing, um, uh, hopefully in the years to come with the entry into service of the 7500, which is a big revenue generator for the company. And the portfolio right now, I mean, we're in a very, very good position at Bombardier. I mean, if you think of the Learjet brand, it is, uh, you know, a franchise on its own, 2,000 aircraft uh, on the market. Uh, the Challenger 350 is the most delivered business jet over the past 10 years. Um, so this is also a, a great product. Everybody knows the Challenger 650 and like the like the derivative, the 600, all that series. Uh, that's about a thousand aircraft out there. The global 5,000 and 6,000, uh, and now the 5,500 and 6,500 that just entered service. We're talking about 900 aircraft in service there, and the global 7,500, which is the product we're going to talk about now, is the most recent development in you know one of the most recent development in business aviation and probably the the like the definitely the best aircraft out there. Okay. And we're talking about the global, you know, global has been a super success uh, for Bombardier, 900 aircraft in service on the franchise. Uh, this is massive uh, number. It is one, if not the most successful ultra long range business, uh, business jet of all time. Uh, real, real success for Bombardier, super reliable platform. Uh, one of the you know thing we're really proud of this airplane has been chosen in you know many um, by many governments around the world for uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, special mission purposes. So the Federal Aviation Administration flies uh, the FAA flies Global 5000. The Luftwaffe also flies uh, Global 5000. The U.S. Air Force has Global uh, 6000 series. And the uh, the Royal Air Force in the UK also operates global. And very often, what's interesting about those uh, those user of aircraft is that they don't use uh, uh, those jets like a typical business jet operator. I'm going to take the example of the U.S. Air Force in particular. Uh, so we sold uh, four aircraft to the US Air Force as part of the BACON program, Battlefield Airborne Communication Node. Basically, as soon as there's a, a US battlefield anywhere, we have a global flying over a battlefield, relaying communication uh, between troops, between ships, between uh, everything. This airplane basically acts as a, a communication point um, I'm telling you, if you're in the cave in Afghanistan somewhere or in a mountain, you're really wishing for that, you know, aircraft to be airborne right above you. So what I'm showing here is utilization of one aircraft, monthly utilization. So you can see that in a period of five months, this aircraft, this one aircraft has flown in the month of January, for example, 543 hours, February 498 flight hours, and March 551 flight hours in a single month. Uh, you know, to put things into perspective, there are 720 hours in a month. So this aircraft was flying, coming down, switching crews, putting fuel, and going back up for three consecutive months uh, nonstop. And, uh, 
Hey, Matt, just, just, just to jump in here on this uh, for the audience, uh, something that is, you know, I guess it's not uh, well known necessarily, but uh, one of the, the nice things about the global platform that's been very, very successful with these specialized missions is that a green aircraft um, coming from, you know, you can look at your 5,000 all the way through the uh, 6,500, um, just the standard aircraft that you would get for a, a normal U.S. operator or Europe operator, it comes with two engine-driven generators on each engine. So that's extremely important for these special uh, missions and all the uh, electronic uh, devices and equipment that needs to be run. So if you really think about it, uh, the redundancy on this aircraft, and obviously, you know, if you look at some of these numbers that they put up here, uh, the redundancy is paramount to these missions, and that's why uh, we're very proud of the uh, systems we have. So, so just looking at the electrical system, you have a total of six generators option um, just with a standard aircraft, and that's including, you know, the two engine driven on each engine, obviously an APU, and uh, it obviously has a, a RAT also. So, um, and not to mention there's a three separate hydraulic systems. So, um, Obviously, as, uh, as Matthew has already talked a little bit about, uh, the 7500 is going to be a little different when it comes to some of the systems, but I just wanted to clarify that, uh, you know, the standard global 55, 65, or 5, or 6,000 um, is, uh, is a very redundant machine. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. And like one other example of this, one aircraft out of the U.S. Air Force fleet is now at 34,000 flight hours on one single airframe. Think about it. In typical corporate jet operation, we're talking, uh, you know, 68 years or so in service uh, to get to that number of flight hours. Jeremy, how much is, is you know, a 34,000 hour airframe worth on the market after? <laughs> 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 at, least, at, at least one thing I can say about that, uh, uh, Matt, is the fact that I bet there's very few avionics failures on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sit and <laughs> get moisture and, and just, you know, things break on it. I bet that uh, very few things break on this airplane because yeah. it's got such a great utilization. But and, and think yeah. about it, utilization like this is done in Afghanistan. So it's not like the, you know, right. the best place to operate a business jet. That's very impressive. So what year model would that be, Matt, out of curiosity? Uh, I think this one delivered in 2010. Okay, so it's 10 years old. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, that, that is really impressive. Yeah, 3,400 hours a year. <laughs> That's amazing. I'll every year you. thank you yeah go back <laughs> continue please but that's truly amazing are there any questions before we move on maybe we open the the panel for questions well the chat is available to anybody that cares to use it uh right now i don't have any questions i don't have any chats okay. uh, we had uh, we had mike christie say Hello, good afternoon all. And that's, that's it so far. So please, uh, those of you that are attending this, uh, please use the, uh, the chat if you'd like to. All right, so moving on to the 7500. So obviously we're building on all the success we have on the global platform uh, with our brand new aircraft, the global 7500 aircraft. So I divided the presentation into four categories. Basically, we're going to first talk about the interior of the plane. Um, I mean, all those uh, private jets are like the business jet world is meant to move people around, uh, around the globe. So like it starts with the cabin. Uh, after that, you can spend a long time in this jet. Uh, and a lot of people are flying long distances on this plane. So we're going to talk about the range and the performance on this, on this plane. Uh, we're going to talk about the smoothest ride in the industry. Uh, so Bombardier jets are really known to have a stable ride and a smooth ride. So we're going to talk about that and finish a bit with the flight deck and some highlights in there. So the industry's pioneer four zone cabin. Uh, so, you know, how the global's different than all the other aircraft out there. It's really that fourth zone. So we've added 
space to the galley. We've added space in front of a, you know, like a big, large crew rest because obviously that aircraft can fly 17 hours. No two pilot can fly 17 hours. So we need a relief uh, crew in there. And that fourth zone, so all the you know, previous aircraft had three big zones, uh, and this one adds a, you know, a fourth nine feet zone to the aircraft. Uh, what this, where, the, that, where that's really a game changer is, is if you have a three zone aircraft out there and like there are so many ultra long range jets out there that have been delivered, if you, if you take out seats on that third zone, you end up with a 10 seat airplane. And a lot of times people don't wanna compromise down to a number of 10 seats. On a Global 7500, even with this configuration that has a bed, uh, you still have uh, 13 seats available for the, the, the passenger. You can, have, you can have 19 seats in this aircraft in a permanent bed. Uh, so we see a lot of aircraft being configured in the back with a proper bedroom for the principal to sleep in the back. Uh, because you don't have to compromise on the number of seats. You can have 15 seats, you can have 16 seats, and still have a you know, private section in the back with a bed. We can add another seat here if the principal wants to you know, be in the back. But suddenly it's a big game changer in that ultra long range category as most of the jets right now don't offer a bed. It was probably a 2% capture rate. And out of the you know, Global 7500 that we're delivering, it's probably a 75% capture rate on beds in the back of the aircraft. Uh, so that's really a game uh, changer in the industry. And the way we designed this plane, uh, it's a bit of a cliche when we say it's designed from the inside out, but that's really the case in this aircraft. As you can see, every section has three big windows. Every seat is aligned with a window. And so we really built the interior concept and then built a fuselage around that interior concept that we, we said, how big do we want the windows? And then we framed all the fuselage around this. Um, so that also allows us because we made every zone equal, because every zone is nine feet long, when we engineer something in the first zone, we can easily transfer it to the second zone as well. So by you know, doing all those multiplications of different configurations we can have, there's over 10,000 standard floor plan permutations you can do in the Global 7500. So we can really customize the plane at delivery to different needs. Uh, if some people want to, you know, the conference grouping in that zone here, we can easily do that. So now they have two sections in the front, maybe as they're configured as club seats for, um, for people to work. And then you have a conference grouping in the third zone, and then maybe just private quarters for the principal in the back that is kind of in between the, 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 the two zones. There are limitless possibilities, basically, you can do with, you know, just by the fact that we engineered uh, everything right in this aircraft. May I ask a question, Matt? Please. Has, uh, has anyone so far selected in their build spec a uh, shower? Uh, I think the shower right now is about a 25% capture rate uh, in what we're specking, which is a high capture rate when you think about it because on we offered a, a shower on the global 6000 and it was a very low capture rate um on the three zone aircraft but you know people are flying longer uh people do not want to spend you know especially these days like if they can avoid a, a night at the hotel they will avoid a, a night at the, at the hotel if you know they can take a shower on the aircraft right now they will do it um so like you know right even before the pandemic like we had already started specking a lot of showers i think that's trends just going to increase in the future interesting thank you very much for answering that pleasure um you know as i was talking about the windows the windows are huge on this aircraft uh, and they're tall the the my favorite feature about those windows is it's the only window in the industry where you can really turn around and i'm 
not especially tall, but I'm five foot eleven. But in most jets I've flown, I always need to, you know, slouch down a little bit to watch out the window. Um, and this one on the tarmac, uh, when you're at the runway, it's so nice because you just turn around and you see the the whole airport around. You don't need to snoop down um, uh, to look around. Uh, so they're tall and they're big. The first comment we get in in any visit on a 5000 is wow, in the 7500 is wow, those windows are are massive, uh, and they are. And you can see that they're always every seat always has a window and every table has a window. And having a, a, a you know a, a window next to your table is also important because when you're working on something, you do want natural light on on what you're looking at. Uh, or if you're eating a meal, now you have natural light on, uh, on your meal as well. Uh, again, I was talking about the, the alignment, the ideal window placement. Another area that we've invested a ton of time and energy was to get the proper lighting system. Uh, you know, Let's let's remind ourselves these jets can fly 17 hours across in multiple different time zones. Uh, so jet lag uh, is a very real, uh, uh, I wouldn't say problem, but something you need to account when you do those long range flights. We designed a lighting system actually that could help you fight jet lag by mimicking the color of the sun from your, your point of departure to your destination, all linked with the FMS, all automatic. And I have a little video that's gonna show this. And we called it the Soleil lighting system. Soleil meaning uh, sun in French. Let me just start this. Any questions on the lighting system? So we have a uh, we have a question. Uh, what is my business case to own and operate the seventy five hundred series, and are there ways to share access on a periodic basis with other operators? And that's a question from Carmelo Turdo. Um, there's, there's certainly ways like programs out there to share. I mean, NetJet is one of the customers that bought into the 7500. Um, you know, right now I have operators uh, opted into a solution of, of sharing, uh, sharing the jet. I'm not sure that our, our initial customers uh, wanted to share their, like they, they, our initial customers didn't put it on a sharing program. Yeah, I would say the best opportunity uh, would be NetJets. They uh, are going to be taking, I think they've got at least three on, three with uh, plenty of other options um, on order for the 7500. So they've already completed their spec and uh, we are building their aircraft as we speak. Excellent. Thank you. 
Um, so another thing, so going a bit into the design of the cabin, I want to show you just a bit. So we saw the, the lighting system, how far the, like the designers at Bombardier went into like thinking of that design. Um, just a whole design, we, we switch from, it's the first aircraft where we switch from having engineers design the plane to industrial designers design the plane. And I'll criticize engineers all day long because I am an engineer, uh, but industrial designer have a very unique way of looking at different things and saying, is this done the, the most efficient way it could be done? As engineers have the opposite saying of saying, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So uh, it's a kind of a different mentality, but it, they forced us to relook at everything and they really came up with a lot of, you know, improvements and little details uh, that really are game changer in this, in this aircraft. For example, they really looked at, you know, how does like the lines of the aircraft work? I mean, car manufacturers do that all the time. Uh, lines are super important. So they looked at the line of the aircraft and you can see that the global, uh, the architecture of the aircraft resembles classical architecture where there's a repetition of, you know, windows that do create those strong horizontal lines. Um, and they try to reproduce that in the interior as well to, you know, have like very strong like lines in the interior. And you can see that the periphery, so all the background is all straight lines. And that's on purpose because we, we wanted a very simple backdrop for the eye to rest directly on the seat, which is like is such an improvement that we did on this aircraft. Um, so as you look through the cabin, your eyes is resting right away on like the architectural piece, which is uh, the seat in this aircraft. So the, the seat, we actually uh, uh, found, found a brand name for it. It's called the Nuage Seat. Uh, nuage means cloud in French. So again, like uh, going into a bit of, of our heritage of, of manufacturing aircraft in Montreal. Um, so Nuage Seat means cloud. And you can see that we've, we've really changed the lines compared to existing seats in the industry. Existing seats in the industry are, are uh, somewhat boxy uh, they're, they're always uh, square straight lines and we wanted to change the game with this seat. So we got uh, most of our inspiration actually from high end furniture. Uh, this is, uh, this piece of furniture is called the Minotti Jensen chair. Um, and it's a classical, uh, piece of, of furniture. Um, and you actually see the, like the, the relaxed line, uh, that is on that seat. And it's one line that we recreated on the new Ash seat. Too. So people are sitting in the seat and not on the seat. Um, so it kind of invites you to go into that seat. And the other important line on the Nuage seat is actually the support line. So you can see that the, the armrest dips a little bit backward uh, and that recreates some of the lines you see on yachts or on Rolls Royce, which is, you know, creates that very uh, you know, uh, elegant, dignified position uh, on the seat. Uh, so just by relooking at the design, uh, we're, you know, changing the, the, the way the cabin feels. So when people sit in this seat, you really, they really like look, really feels like they're cradled uh, in the seat. Uh, you know, compared to the traditional seat, like as I, as I was saying, the, the lines are very straight, very boxy. Uh, the backrest is always straight. And the other effect of this is that takes volume away from the passenger. Uh, I'm sure like, you know, a lot of, of, of people or, you know, a lot of pilots and, you know, and their wives uh, have made them watch like the decoration shows and they always say declutter 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 in those shows um, and this is what we're doing with that seat see we're carving out a lot of volume uh, out of the seat and giving it back to the passengers um, you know we have and we changed the mechanism on that seat so the the the, the you know it's the first seat in in aviation basically all seats in aviation right now move a bit awkwardly when you want to turn them into the cabin and nobody knows why. And the reason why is because you have a, a rotation mechanism and a tracking mechanism on top. Uh, so basically, as you move the seat on the new ash seat, 
your tracking and then your rotation point stays underneath you like a normal chair. So our chair moves like a normal chair. All the traditional seat, if you look at them, they actually have the rotate the tracking mechanism on top. So you're going to track your seat. And after that, when you want to rotate, you're actually rotating at an arm because the rotation is backwards, the rotation mechanism. So now the seat, that's why all, all seats in business jet always move a bit awkwardly because they, they don't work like a normal seat. So the industrial designers told the engineers, we need to change that. The engineer said, can't be done, was never done, but we still did, did it. Uh, another you know, aspect of that seat is the deep recline. So deep recline, <clears throat> the seat pan actually dips as you recline your backrest. If you don't move the seat pan, you start falling out of your seat. Uh, as depicted in this picture, uh, you have a straight seat pan. As soon as you move your backrest, suddenly you start to slide out of your seat. Uh, so this one cradles you. So in a reclined position, you're firmly still in your seat because we've shifted your weight from your thighs to your lower back. And uh, finally, in this position, I'm looking for head support because now I don't want to be looking at the ceiling. I want to be looking forward. So we have a pivoting headrest that supports the head in that position. So I can be in a reclined position, watch TV, or talk to a person in front of me in a super comfortable position. As traditional seats, you see like that headrest is going to move up and down. So it's not going to do anything to support my head when I'm in a reclined position. So all these improvements we did to the seat, and we're talking about volume that I removed. See, this is all like place that I gave back to the passengers, uh, so like to move into the cabin. And, and uh, real, real quick, Matt, I just wanted to, to add a little comment here on the seat. So just uh, for full, you know, functional of the seat, uh, as far as an example of berthing, which has always been awkward in most uh, most aircraft of having to spin around the seat and, and laying one down and getting them together. The nice thing about the nuage seat is that it's just its seat itself. I would I would think that um, you wouldn't even have to berth it to sleep in it. So I think that ideally, you know, principals will find uh, or passengers that the seat itself is is comfortable enough just in its normal state and in a reclined position to actually do your sleeping in that mode versus actually birthing it, which it can still do. But the nice functional uh, aspect of this seat is that you don't have to spin around anything. So basically he showed you earlier that that base, basically there's a, uh, a little tab, a, uh, a button that you can press with right your here. foot. Yes. And you basically will just push them together. So obviously have the, have the leg rest down, but uh, that is simply if you wanted to use a bed or, you know, apply sling to the top of it to create a bed, um, there's no spinning of the seats required. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Jonathan. And as, as Jonathan was mentioning, like uh, there's a real home-like feeling when you board this aircraft. Uh, and you get a home-like feeling when you design uh, furniture in the aircraft to look like furniture. So see at the end of the bed here, we didn't put any cabinets. We left open room. You typically don't put anything at the end uh, of your bed. It's it like, so it leaves room open uh, in the cabin and it, it does feel like home. Look at a credenza design, for example. We left room open so that the credenza looks like a piece of furniture. You don't have, you rarely have wall-to-wall -wall furniture in your home. So why have that in your airplane? And that leaves a perfect place. If somebody walks in with a briefcase or a little bag, they can put it and you, you give them uh, room to put their stuff as they board to, uh, inside the aircraft. And that helps also with the home-like feeling of the aircraft. Okay, and super important these days uh, it are the, like the, the, the modes of the environmental control system on the global. We do have a HEPA filter on the global. Uh, it's super important. Uh, global air is replaced in this aircraft every minute and 30 seconds. The whole cabin air gets replaced and everything get, like gets also filtered through a HEPA filter. Um, and a HIPAA filter as a 99, this like the one that we have on our aircraft has a 99.99% .99 efficiency. And if you want to know how HEPA filter are rated, um, 
They're rated against a 0.3 microns in size because that's the hardest particle to catch for a HEPA filter. Uh, but anything smaller than this is actually a higher efficiency and everything bigger than this is also a higher efficiency than 99.99. So like in all cases, it's a very, very efficient. It's the same solution they use in the hospital room and clean rooms. Uh, the question that everybody asks is what's the size of a coronavirus? So the coronavirus is about 0.1 micron in uh, size. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, it is caught uh, through uh, all the mechanism at an even higher percentage. If it were by itself, when it's on a sneeze droplet, uh, it's about 2.5 microns to 10 microns, and it still gets, uh, you know, it's above that 0.3 micron mark. So it still gets an even higher efficiency than 99.99%. Um, so just so you know, a HEPA filter works. Uh, it's a very efficient uh, solution. Uh, and especially these days, that's super important on, on every environment. Matt, I have a question regarding the environmental system, yes. uh, which uh, would be of interest to uh, the viewers, I think, is uh, the, the flow of the air through the cabin. Is it front to back, back to front? Are there multiple points? How does it work? It's multiple points, uh, so the air is distributed throughout the cabin. Obviously, the air comes from the engine, uh, but it's distributed everywhere uh, inside the, uh, the cabin and goes from, if I'm not mistaken, is bottom to top uh, afterwards. And where are the outflow valves? The outflow valves are in the front. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I have a little video on Bombardier Pure Air, which is our you know, air filtration system. What I add on the cabin, are there any and, questions? Uh, Matt, it's Jonathan. I just wanted to just to throw in a couple comments on the air system. So obviously, you know, this is a, uh, you know, it's, it's paramount right now of what we're doing, you know, going through a pandemic and, and this is front and center when it comes to airline travel and concerns for spreading the virus. But, uh, you know, this technology has been available on all of our global platforms, starting with the, uh, I'm going to say, I don't know if the XRS, but I can at least say with confidence, what is it, Matt, through the 5,000, through the, the, the global, global Express, yeah. yeah. All right. So any of the globals, we've always had the ability to have a recirculation option. And I just want to make it clear that, you know, we do have a fresh air option, just like anyone else or any other um, OEMs and what they offer. But simply, this system is a, a self-contained system with filters, as uh, Matt went through, and it is an option. So basically, it's just like your car. Um, if you want to uh, heat or cool uh, your car, you would put it on uh, recirculation. So it's that just that little button you have in your, in your car, and it's the same thing for the cockpit. Um, one of the benefits of this that we found early on before we were going through a pandemic was the fact that um, you're able to, if you have a hot or cold soaked aircraft, let's just say we have a video, I don't know if we'll be able to make, have some time to show it today, but we, ho we heat soaked a uh, global 6,000 out in uh, Las Vegas. And I think the interior temperature came up to close to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I believe the, uh, the, if you have recirculation on with the APU on and the pack open, 
um, on full cool, I think the, uh, the time frame to cool or heat the cabin will be cut in half. So we do have some more um, data points on that if, if, if anyone has any questions on that. But um, if anyone's been uh, cleaning an aircraft or getting an aircraft ready for a long flight and you know, either you know, you're up in, uh, you're in Siberia or you're you know, in the West Coast of the United States, um, having that functionality of just hitting a button and cooling the aircraft down in half the time of a conventional aircraft is, uh, is outstanding. Um, the other thing nice about having a, a uh, recirculation system in an aircraft is if you're doing any uh, long trips, uh, i.e. to China, for example, with a lot of polluted areas or India, um, as you're coming through, you know, usually the mid-20s or uh, the, the high teens, you can start to kind of smell some of the uh, pollutants in the air. So one of the nice features about this um, is having the ability to turn on that recirculation as you're descending in some of these larger cities that have air pollution problems and you will not have any kind of smell uh, in the cabin. Thanks, Matt. Are there any other questions? All right, so moving on to performance. Uh, and the Global is a really complete aircraft in terms of performance. It has like the longest range. Uh, it has the fastest speed. It is an amazing aircraft in terms of field performance. Uh, and all of this without ever compromising smooth ride on the aircraft. Um, and we have a couple examples of this. Uh, so in terms of range, the, this aircraft can fly 7,700 nautical miles at Mach 8.5. Uh, so it's truly a long range aircraft and can fly you know, over 6,000 nautical miles at Mach 9.0. Um, so it is really a long endurance aircraft. One of the proof points of this, we did fly a leg from Sydney all the way to Detroit which was a 17 and a half hour flight, if you think about it. So, you know, like over 8,000 nautical mile, uh, you know, traveled on this uh, journey. And something to think about um, for our viewers, um, you know, this, when, it, when I was doing some of these records at the previous OEM I worked for, um, you know, it depends on what we were trying to achieve. And I was a part of some of the records that uh, we had out there. Um, a big part of it was making sure it was the right day. Uh, we would have numerous demo aircraft and have the ability to, you know, position crews and, and make sure that, you know, we find the right day basically to, to set the record. Um, one of the uh, interesting uh, phenomenons about this aircraft and how we, we, we did these records and did these endurance flights were that, you know, we only had one demonstrator. So and it's still the case now. So we didn't have the ability to, you know, that airplane as was scheduled, you know, at least eight months or almost a year in advance to where it needed to be for air shows or actual demos for potential clients. So all of our records and all, all, all of these long range flights that are just, you know, absolutely amazing as far as what we were able to achieve in this aircraft for endurance, um, especially at 8.5 as long range crews. Uh, but the fact is that basically our crews would come in country with the aircraft. They would have their, their duty rest, uh, mandatory rest day, and uh, come straight out. And whatever the, whatever the day was, whatever the jet stream was, whatever the winds were, they uh, were like, all right, well, the aircraft needs to be back in the U.S. or wherever it needs to be. So the, uh, the flights were then just launched. So I just want to make that very clear. We're, we're very transparent about um, the, uh, the, the endurance and the capability of this aircraft. And there's, there's nothing that lies beneath the surface here. So um, I just want to say, we, when, when we publish anything like this, these are real, real time days and just uh, it would be an average day where we're departing from one of these cities. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, and as Jonathan was saying, like this is our demo and our demo is not a, um, a slim configuration. Uh, I mean, we have extra wide seats in front. We have like, you know, bulkheads inside the aircraft. We have large TV, uh, entertainment room. We have a permanent bed. We have hard floor, like stone flooring in like the kitchen lavatories uh, in front. We have like, you know, fully equipped galley. We have K band on this aircraft. So it like, it, like obviously our demonstrator is meant to, you know, to show everything that we can do uh, and, you know, sell some options. So this aircraft is really equipped and that's the aircraft we did all the, the uh, demonstration with. 
Um, you know, I plotted a range map here from uh, St. Louis. You can reach all the way to Taipei, uh, Shanghai, uh, Asia with this aircraft. Um, and that's from all the airports in the area, whether it's, uh, you know, Lambert or Cahokia. Uh, and I did the same thing going the other way around here. You clear every point in Europe, you, you know, go all the way to uh, Dubai there. So, um, you know, exceptional range on this aircraft and also fast speeds. Um, you know, Mach 85, Mach 90 or top speed of Mach 925. Uh, I mean, we took this aircraft to 995 in uh, flight test. Uh, we did a record flight from Los Angeles to New York in three hours and 54 minutes. We flew that route at Mach 925, uh, broke the speed record. We then took that aircraft from New York to London in five hours and 26 minutes. Uh, only three days after we flew that route, I think it was a big portion at Mach 92 uh cruise um and so it's a fast aircraft and in terms of field performance um i can show you numbers this is like you know, maximum takeoff weight but i have a actually a demonstration that i think speaks more than numbers And Matt, uh, something we should probably add to that is the, uh, I believe the fuel load for that little demonstration video that we did, I want to say they had at least eight or nine hours endurance of fuel on when they uh, did that. So I just want to make sure that everyone realizes yeah. that it's not like we only had, you know, minimum fuel on board for that. So I think it was uh, done with the expectation it would have been a uh, flight, you know, a transcon flight. Oh, you're uh, right. I... And we have a comment, uh, John Salami from SATCOM Direct said, wow. And I agree with that. <laughs> Good. That was pretty awesome. I got to admit, I'm going back on you, but thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we appreciate uh, that comment, sir. Uh, another, another fun fact. We're going to be hopefully going out here soon and I'll get out of Savannah and, and be able to travel with uh, the team here as soon as uh, we're allowed to travel. Um, we're going to start taking this to a little bit uh, more challenging airports also. So I, we just uh, had a customer look at it. I think it was what, East, Ham Am East Hampton, yeah, uh, we Matthew? Yeah, East Hampton, yeah. Yeah, so uh, really the, the performance on this aircraft is, is second to none. So um, if there's anything we can ever do or if anyone would like uh, to do a deep dive on performance numbers on a possible client or your flight department that you know utilizes some short fields this is the uh the aircraft that can do it and then vice versa it can also go 18 hours Thanks, yeah if you if you are looking for you know to go to difficult airports with a a, a long-range aircraft the global is definitely 
like one of the alternative you should you should look at this these aircraft perform so well from runway uh, i have another example here we took the the global 7500 in london city so we are sort of like we can like we have the steep approach capability on this aircraft we took the aircraft took off from London City, 4,500 feet of runway, and flew all the longest flight out of London City all the way to Los Angeles and landed with 5,000 pounds of fuel. Yeah, and, and Matt, just so you know, we just got a question on, uh, from one of our viewers here. Yeah. Um, they were curious about uh, range out of Aspen. I think we probably can answer that. Uh, yes, I don't have it here. Uh, so the, the so this aircraft right now cannot access Aspen, and the reason for that is wingspan limitation. Right now, currently, they have a, a wingspan limitation of 95 feet in Aspen. Um, so uh, from Aspen, we cannot uh, we cannot operate right now until they have plans to do to separate the taxiway and the runway. And that should increase that limit for wingspan. Uh, but until they do the modification, uh, right now we cannot, as you know, other large aircraft in this segment cannot operate in Aspen. The largest jet that can go to Aspen is the Global 6500. Yeah, and 6500 will fly Aspen all the way to any point in Europe you want to go to. So, so I got a question. What is the most challenging airport that you have uh, tested the aircraft in an out of would it be that, it, it looks like like we're staged but we're not the most difficult airport we took this aircraft to is called Gstad uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I'm not pronouncing this well but we took it to Gstad uh, Sanen airport in Switzerland and I actually have a video of this so thank you for the lead up <laughs> familiar yeah. with uh, Sanan Airport, uh, it is, you know, a, a very wealthy area in, uh, in Switzerland, a very nice uh, ski resorts all around um, and a, a very prized destination. And like we have 3,500 feet of landing available in the mountains, if you, if you can figure that out. So this is like landing in Santa Monica, if Santa Monica were surrounded by mountains. Yeah, another, another thing to add to that, and I think we'll go into this a little bit with performance, Matt, and stop, stop me if we, ha we are going to go there. But a, a big reason uh, we can achieve these landing distances is just is pure ref speed. So, you know, with our wing design, um, uh, when I first started flying the Global, so when I was hired two years ago, I went and did pilot demos in the, uh, in the Global at the time, 6,000, which is now the 6,500. But one of the things I noticed, uh, my first approach, I did uh, about six back-to-back -back approaches and landings in the aircraft with one of our uh, test pilots. And I, and I kept on asking for, for what's going to be ref, and I was just totally shocked when it comes to our ref speeds. So... Um, I have flown the Iron Bird for the 7500, but uh, it's really across the whole global uh, platform. But, um, you know, with those leading edge devices in the wing design, we do not add any artificial speed to ref. Um, so that's, that's a very important uh, point when it comes to how we operate these in the short field. So uh, we just basically, here you go. So, so on a normal day with no gusts, we are flying ref. We're not adding five, we're not adding 10. Um, and in a normal loaded 7,500, since we're, this is what we're talking about right now, 
I would say an average fuel load from a, a flight, a, a very a conservative uh, proper reserve would be about 5,000 pounds. Uh, MBAA averages would be obviously less, but just, you know, a normal professional flight crew would, would have at least, you know, four to 5,000 pounds. So that would be the typical landing fuel for a 7,500. And, and don't make me a liar here, Matt, but I, you know, you're going to be around a, like 111, 112 uh, knots as your final ref. And, and once you do it in the aircraft, uh, it's just, it's absolutely inspiring. It's just, it's just how slow the aircraft's actually moving through the air. And, uh, and that's, and that's it. And that's what that really sets us apart for yeah. um, our landing um, and data and performance. And, and Jonathan, to add to this, like it, that aircraft is so stable at low speed that even in gusty air, uh, that like the VRF adder is only half of the gust increment. Uh, so in some other aircraft, you need to add like a steady, st like a steady state wind component plus a full gust increment up to 20 knots. This one, half the gust, maximum correction of 10 knots. Uh, it, it yields to exceptionally short uh, field performance uh, on this aircraft. And this is like due to the wing design. The fact that we have a slatted wing, um, and in this case, we have a double slotted inboard Fowler flaps, uh, generates a ton of lift and, and you know it is able to slow down the aircraft so much and make it so stable into low speed uh, approaches. Gentlemen, I'm going to interject here just for five seconds and say we we are at the one hour point and we said we would run this for an hour and a half. So you have 30 minutes remaining. So I should have 15 minutes, so we should be good. So we'll have some time for questions as well. Thank yes. you. And, and also talk about your used aircraft and legacy aircraft as well. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, of smooth ride, you know, so we looked at all those performance, those on the, the global don't compromise the ride quality. Uh, because of the slat, we're able to have actually a relatively small wing uh, in cruise, uh, which yields the aircraft to having a high wing loading in cruise. So because that wing is so advanced, we're able to have maybe... I like to say two wings and one. We have one wings for, for, for cruise, which is sleek, super efficient, fast, and small. And we have one, week for, uh, one wing for landing, which when we deploy the slats and the flaps on this thing, we just massively increase the surface uh, and the lift. And suddenly we have another wing for low speed characteristics. And smooth ride, uh, I mean, Bombardier makes a lot of marketing on smooth ride, but uh, you know, it is proven and it is proven that turbulence is increasing, uh, you know, in the world by 2050, it's projected to go like go up everywhere in the world by factors of 100% to 181% increase um, in different places in the world. So it is something to uh, consider in the purchase of a, you know, a jet that's going to last for the, the upcoming years. And the, the whole premise of smooth ride technology the two biggest factors that contribute to smooth ride is high wing loading and high wing flexibility. Those are, you know, definite in terms of smooth ride. They are documented by all the, the top aircraft designers in the world. These are the guys that write the engineering book uh, for everybody to use after. Ross Cam, Torren Beek, and Raymer are the top three aircraft designer that all uh, you know, commented and wrote about uh, you know, the stability of aircraft is based on wing loading and wing flexibility uh, in the air. And everybody that tests a global attest Test attest to the fact that it has a, a fantastic ride. Uh, recently, we had Fred George fly the aircraft, uh, and he had amazing comments on the the ride quality on the global. Um, and on the global, you do feel the wing move. You will see the wing move, uh, but it is a good thing because as the wing moves, it transmits less vibrations inside the cabin. Uh, and this is why we have a flexible wing design on the Global 7500. Yeah, just to add on to that for a little bit, um, Matt, even when you're taxiing out in this aircraft, you are able to see this massive flex as you're going over uneven uh, taxiways or wherever you're going on the ramp and then uh, taxiing to the active runway. 
Uh, but you can't, you don't get that jarring drop when you go over these cracks in the taxiway, you know, you, but you do see it being absorbed in these wings. Uh, and another thing just absolutely uh, just astonishing to me was when you are, when you actually lift off or you're, you're coming in, you're flaring, you will immediately when you do V1 rotate, you're going to see these wings kind of bow up. So immediately, it doesn't matter what, what weight you're at, these things are going to be bowing up and absorbing um, turbulence just, you know, immediately as, you know, really since you get out of the, uh, when you get out of the gate. Um, so it is, uh, I think we have some videos of those we can share with uh, the folks um, if, if we need a request, but um, yeah. it's something to see. All right. So final point we wanted to, to discuss is obviously the flight deck. We know we have some uh, pilots in, in the audience, and this is really the most advanced flight deck uh, in the world. We are so uh, proud of the flight deck uh, on the 7500 aircraft. And this, you know, the Bombardier technology is so advanced that, you know, the automation on this aircraft is not replicated anywhere right now in our industry. And we're very proud of this. Um, so it is a, a Collins Aerospace Fusion Suite uh, on, on the Global. Um, every pilot that is familiar with the Global family of aircraft will you know, find its, its, uh, its uh, bearings in this aircraft. Um, and Collins is very interesting in, in many ways. Um, on one is the synthetic vision uh, from Collins Aerospace, I find is, is very interesting because they do have a dome representation of the airport. And this thing can save you uh, day in, day out when you're, you know, flying into unfamiliar territories is the bread and butter of corporate aviation, flying into uncontrolled airfields. Uh, this uh, avionics suite will tell you with the dome exactly the representation of the airport you're going at. Uh, it will also have another dome for the alternate airport. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you're coming in, it's really a, a, a great safety feeling that it gives you to really know where the, 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 air, the exact location of the airport. And as, as you approach, this airport will become transparent and then you will see the runway in the synthetic vision. Jonathan? And just to, yeah, just to add on to this, um, it's paramount for you know going in uncontrolled or you know new aircraft or new uh, airports in unfamiliar territory. Uh, I've used this uh, on another platform. I've used the Fusion for years, and I've had a chance to to play with it on our globals also. But I feel like these uh, these domes are um, are just a complete game changer when it comes to situational awareness. Um, what I used to do um, when I was flying full time is that it's very easy with the Collins box. You can set up a five, uh, 10, 15 mile final um, with really just a couple presses of a button. And there's, you can either do it with your cursor control device. You can, you can, uh, you can click on the actual uh, identifier of the airport you're going to and, and do it that way, or really just, you know, manipulating the FMS box with like two or three button pushes, you can put in a existing ILS or any, any of the runways you can, uh, you know, obviously put in a, an approach that is, is existing for that runway. But most importantly, what I would do if we're clear for the visual is that I would extend that uh, line off the active runway. And at that point with synthetic vision, and obviously you got to check your MSAs and everything like that, but I would extend that line out and there is no way that you are not going to be on a perfect 45 or 90 degree intercept for the runway. So not only do you have the dome, you know, go ahead and just extend this, you know, line uh, for a visual approach, uh, catch the glide slope, L nav, V nav approach armed and the actual, the, the aircraft will fly uh, the uh, visual approach that you just selected for that airport. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Another point where Bombardier is shining, we were the first manufacturer to introduce synthetic vision on the head up display. And, and this is, sorry for the quality of the picture. This is actually one of our demo pilot taking a shot with his iPhone in uh, Anchorage. He's doing the approach. So he's gonna go over the mountains uh, to the right. To the right, you see the airport dome that is represented. So from far away, you know exactly where you're going. Look at the exact representation of synthetic vision over the mountains. 
it is striking how precise that instrument is. And the Bombardier philosophy is also interesting. The, the symbology on the head-up display is the same symbology as the uh, primary flight display. If the pilots go you know, uh, up and down, uh, the, it's the same uh, reference that they have, whether they look on the head-up display or whether they, they look, whether they look on the primary flight display. Uh, so it's not, you never have to adapt to a different kind of symbology from going from one to the other. Um, and, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, aided vision. The other one that we have is a new EVS uh, camera. And on this one, it's a three sensor uh, system. Uh, so uh, one is geared at visual uh, uh, light emitting um, uh, infrareds. Uh, the other one is, is to look at contrast in between uh, different uh, uh, IR signature. And the third one is actually meant to look at uh, LED lights. So this EVS system can pick up uh, LED lights um, uh, going into uh, a, an airport. Uh, so that you know, camera uh, we find is one of the most advanced uh, in the market for sure. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to give you a, a, a tip. We're about to deliver our first aircraft with a, a dual HUD. Uh, this was, will probably be the first aircraft uh, ever with dual HUD uh, in service. Uh, so we were pretty proud of that. So now both pilots can look at the enhanced vision system or the synthetic vision and confirm uh, with each other what they're seeing outside. And just something to uh, bring up since we're looking at this picture, uh, Matt, at this point is that, you know, you can see everyone that there are two iPads uh, situated to the left and right of the uh, pilot and co-pilot seat. Um, those are not necessarily required. And I just want that to be very clear. Obviously, as, as a crew, um, you need backup for charts and uh, just for your, you know, uh, if it's of a long flight, you know, you can surf the internet or whatever else you need for reference. Um, not that I ever did that, but the nice the, <laughs> the nice thing about this uh, about this platform is my favorite thing about it is the fact that we're really getting a, getting away from books. We're getting away from actual checklists as far as hard bound uh, checklists, and we're getting away from iPads. So the nice thing about this uh, avionics suite is that the cast messaging system is actually what alerts you, um, obviously for an abnormal or a normal situation or an emergency situation. Um, and simply, you know, you don't have to worry about the charge on your iPad. You don't have to have it on your lap to, to scroll through it. If you're, if you're in an emergency situation, the cast messaging, cast messaging system itself will prompt you to the appropriate checklist. Um, in my prior life, you know, there was always some times in the simulator where, you know, we're going through a hydraulic simulated failure or something on that, um, on that point. And it's very, very easy if you're using an iPad to go down a rabbit hole the wrong way. So, uh, basically, let's just say you had a right hydraulic failure. Well, you know, the system is so smart that it's going to prompt you with the right system hydraulic uh, failure checklist. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. I do have a, uh, a little video I have on LinkedIn that walks us through a V1 cut and relight. Uh, it's about five minutes long, so we decided not to bore you guys with that uh, for this presentation. But um, you have high and root charts um, located on that middle screen, the MFD. Uh, you obviously have your, your uh, approach charts capable. You have something called an airport moving map, which is a very slick uh, way to taxi around. Shows high, hot spots, uh, shows gates, uh, shows stands numbers. Um, very, very, uh, you know, once we are able to go for the Jefferson uh, airport diagram on an iPad or even in one of the DUs, that was a huge help with situational awareness, but this just takes it to another level. Um, so not having to use the iPad for charts not having to use it for any kind of emergency or abnormal checklist, um, I think is, is probably one of the best, uh, you know, uh, advances we've had in, in the last five years um, as, as far as corporate aviation. I'm trying to think there's uh, one other nice aspect of it is that we do have a maintenance manager in the aircraft. Um, you know, obviously you're going to go through a cast message, you know, go through the appropriate checklist, but um, you can also go to a, a maintenance manager that will tell you exactly what is at fault and kind of walk you through that. All your AFM, I think we call it the FPOM at Bombardier, 
all of that data is, is stored in your, uh, in your database in the aircraft. So if you need to reference a, uh, a cruise chart, you know, all of that is available in your uh, MFD there. Um, and also if you have uh, high and low in route charts are also available. So just little stuff like that, getting away from iPads, getting away from actual charts, um, it's, it's an absolute game changer. Thanks, Matt. Jonathan, I'd like to interject here though, uh, speaking as, a, as, as an outsider from Bombardier, but very much in the industry, the, the, the biggest thing uh, that can be seen by this slide is the control columns have not been removed so you can see the Proline Fusion you, this is the first Bombardier Global that has side sticks, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we okay. were going to, yeah. Go, we're probably I, I go left there. that for the yeah. end, but a yeah. good observation. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's a really good comment, uh, Jeremy. It was, it was interesting because when I first started flying the 6000 Vision, um, the avionics suite, uh, the, the fusion suite that's in the 5,000, 6,000, 55, 6,500, it was obviously set up for a side stick aircraft. So if you look there, you can see your little uh, artificial directoral, uh, directional gyro there uh, in the middle of the screens on the D1 and 3. And, um, you know, obviously our 55 and 65 and 5 and 6,000 uh, models do not have fly-by-wire. So um, you're very, very much looking at the same picture um, in our other globals. It's just uh, you have a control rule there, but uh, we're going to go into that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, be, just before we get to that, like all, all globals, the integration of the avionics suite is, is you know, unsurpassed in the industry. So for, like, for example, I'm going to give you one like very s simple example. There's no fuel transfer in a global. All the fuel transfer is always automatic. The only thing you need to worry about is that switch being on auto and the aircraft will take care of fuel transfer on its own. It will prompt you that there's a fuel imbalance. It will start transferring the fuel. If you have a 400 pound imbalance, it will transfer the fuel. Once it's done, it will prompt another cast message that the fuel has been transferred. And that's all you had to do to you know, manage fuel during the flight. Um, so it is super, um, uh, you know, we've, we've put the right technology in there. Technology doesn't have to be flashy. Technology is what helps the pilot uh, really do his job. Yeah, and also, get, yep. yeah just, sorry. just to add on to that a little bit with the, uh, the way the overhead panel is set up to, Matt, to Matt's point. Um, it's the first aircraft that I, uh, and this goes for any of our global visions. So really the 5,000, 6,000, 55, 65, and 7,500. Um, the logic built into this overhead is, uh, is outstanding. So we, we don't teach flows on this. So uh, that was the first thing I was kind of worried about before I started flying the airplane a little bit. Uh, they're just really not necessary. I mean, you do do some sort of flow and that's basically just starting on the top left and coming down. But the, really the only thing um, getting the APU started and, and getting these engines started is that you are just verifying for the most part that all of these switches, it doesn't matter if you're on, uh, if you're looking at the PAC system, you're looking at the APU system, the bleed air, um, it's going to be the, the fuel system, hydraulic system does have three, you can see over here on the left side, you have three separate uh, units as a, you know, traditional toggle switches, but you can see also in those, those are on auto too. Um, so really all you're doing getting in the aircraft is verifying these, you know, you're going through your electronic checklist, verifying these knobs are in the auto position. And if they're out, you know, just put them into the 12 o'clock position and, um, just go through the checklist. Uh, as far as bleed air, it's the same system, uh, as, as, as set up as far as the, uh, the fuel system is meaning that when you start an engine, the, all the valves, um, will close and open. Uh, based on what activity you've selected. So as you're on APU bleed to start the first engine, you just you simply just switch a switch underneath the pedestal and underneath the throttles. Um, automatically that will, uh, you know, give you uh, pneumatic pressure or bleed air from the APU to start the engine. Once, if it's in auto mode, um, that pack is going to come on automatically and at that point. So at that point, you've got the left side uh, pack, um, you know, providing air for the cabin and the cockpit. And then at that point, you know, you go ahead and start your second engine and it will close that off and APU will open up and, and, and the same process. So there's really not a lot to do. And there's, and, and the way I look at it as a pilot and as an operator is there's not a lot of gotchas on this aircraft, which is best for me because there's less things for me to screw up. Go ahead, Matt. 
Well, uh, another thing, how can we simplify the pilot's life and, and do the, like the, the a shorter checklist on takeoff, less time to prepare the aircraft? These are self-diagnostic checklists. Why have the pilot validate something that the aircraft can tell? I mean, if the you know, hydraulic pump is working, the aircraft can detect that instead of the pilot checking a screen on the avionics and then confirming it on the checklist, all the checklist, when the aircraft can sense it, it will. Obviously, the airplane cannot know if an airplane flight publication is on board, so the pilot needs to check that. But all the others, everything that the aircraft can self-diagnose, it will on your checklist. You can do the checklist in order, not in order. The co-pilot and the pilot can do each half of the checklist and then meet in the middle, and when all the items are green, you're good to go. You and can... Yeah, just to add on that a little bit, just when you're doing abnormal and emergency checklists, and we'll go into this about the uh, V1 cut I showed on LinkedIn, um, but uh, the system is so smart is that if it's, like, like Matt said, if, if the system is in auto and it's done what it needed to be done or, or been accomplished as far as the system is concerned, you will not even, you, you cannot even click the box on the actual cast messages. So once we, you, know, you bring up the emergency and you have your list and your checklist, um, they're going to be about four or five items that are already kind of blanked out. Um, you know, you'll be able to read it, but there's, you can't even, you can't even select it and uh, say it's been done because the computer knows it's in the right position. Yeah. I, I want to interject very, very quickly. in as much as we see your uh, cursor device floating over the checklist, but the fact is fusion is a touch screen system. So you don't, have to use the cursor system to go through this. I just wanted to bring that point up. Um, so, no. uh, no. go ahead. So uh, after that, the uh, multi-scan uh, weather radar from Rockwell is uh, from Collins Aerospace. Sorry, is the like most advanced uh, in the world. It reads weather differently whether you're in different parts uh, of the world. It is super uh, advanced. Um, you know, Bombardier, like uh, Jonathan was saying, the dark cockpit philosophy, uh, this overhead panel with a quick glance, if there's no lights, everything is running on normal. That's your flow. You look up, no lights, every switch are in the 12 o'clock position, you're good to go. That, that was your, that's how fast your, your, your flow goes uh, because we, everything is dark. As soon as you have a lights on, you do have the attention grabbing potential. Uh, and again, keeping buttons, all the buttons have different shapes. So you do have a tactile feedback as you are implementing command on the overhead panel. And finally, Jeremy, to your point, uh, the fly-by-wire system with a side stick is a super robust for Bombardier. The, the, the important thing for us in implementing a fly-by-wire system was to make it robust. Fly-by-wire is not meant to be fancy technology. It's meant to be you know, always working uh, technology. We took the same system that Bombardier designed for the Airbus 220. Um, that is a Bombardier design. We took the same system, same reliability needed by the airline and put it into our flagship Global 7500 uh, and are having a super entry into service with our fly-by-wire system in terms of reliability. Um, Final uh, conclusion, so the Global 7500 is a true industry flagship. Uh, it does bring uh, an industry, like the, the pioneer four zone cabin in the industry with uh, you know, so much enhancements in the interior. So the new ash seat and all the, the uh, interior enhancements you saw, you saw the field performance uh, example. I mean, this aircraft can fly fast and it can fly really slow to like really difficult airfields. Uh, the smoothest ride in the industry and, and the most advanced flight deck. So I was wondering if you have any uh, final questions. We made it five minutes before the deadline. I do, uh, if you don't mind me asking this question. And the question is, uh, let's disregard that we're currently undergoing uh, quarantine from COVID-19 and say we are living in our normal situation uh, and I am a uh, wealthy person 
and I call Ed or Jonathan and say, I want to buy one. How long will it take for me to get the airplane? I'm just curious. The process from from uh, placing the initial order is it is it a year is it 18 months how long does it take we're uh, right now jeremy we're looking at late 22 late for 22. availability and and the list price is uh 75 million is that right 72 72 the blue book is yep. wrong <laughs> today today's special jeremy 72 <laughs> yeah all right Thank you. And if some, someone orders one today, maybe we can go lower. We'll see. Excellent. And how, do, how does it work from the point of view? You, you, you place an order. Do you, do you come to Montreal or no. Wichita to spec the airplane? How do you, or do you do it? Uh, do, they, do they come to your office? Would they come to me? To that's, that's, well, yeah, go ahead, Ed. We, we would prefer you come to Montreal or have us bring you to Montreal to do the specification exercise, but certainly we have the capability to come to you. Um, but Montreal would be the most efficient place where we've got, you know, our, our delivery, our design center, uh, everything's right there. So that that's the preference, but if we need to get somewhere, we will. Yeah. And also um, on that, we do have a New York office now in Midtown Manhattan. So uh, with the border being closed and some of the difficulties with what's been going on now, um, we do have a small spec uh, design center in, uh, in Manhattan that I've actually utilized for one of my customers uh, just uh, in January. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it will not have all the samples that we would have up in Montreal, but uh, we can get the job done there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, I don't see any other questions. We've, uh, we've got uh, three minutes by my reckoning before we uh, bring this to a close. So if anyone has any last minute questions, please uh, uh, type them into chat. And uh, um, while, we're, while we're about it, uh, I know we've got Mark Sabensky, uh, your used uh, representative. He's been on the entire time, but muted. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the used aircraft uh, and the process? Mark, well, you... if, if, if he's still on mute, uh, I could touch on that a little bit. Our, our pre-owned inventory is, is always pretty fluid. Um, you know, it... Uh, it can change quickly. I mean, there, there's times where we have airplanes that are scheduled to uh, to come in on trade that that sell before before we would ever get them. So the best thing to do is just pick up the phone and call us. And while we do have dedicated people on the pre-owned side, uh, any of us on uh, on the the front line sales-wise can can help with inventory questions and what's available and when we would, when we would have it available to deliver. Yeah, we current, this is Mark. We currently have a few available aircraft, but if you just get a hold of us, we can, um, you know, put you on the list for what might be in the works. That's great. Thank you, Mark. And uh, uh, how do people get in touch with you? I'm on the Bombardier uh, businessaircraft.bombardier.com website, and I believe every one of you uh, today can be uh, connected through uh, the website. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you guys to answer that. Yep, for sure. That's uh, If you don't already have our contacts, the website is a, is a great tool that can, that can get you to any one of us. Excellent. Oh, uh, we have another. Uh, so, uh, so <laughs> Don Boyce, uh, long time uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, industry man here in St. Louis, uh, uh, does a lot of uh, dealings with uh, different airplanes. Now he, uh, he actually uh, follows airplanes through completion. Uh, he said, great airplane. Thanks for the great presentation from Don. So um, uh, with, with that, I think I'm going to also say thank you uh, very much indeed. I think it's been an extremely informative uh, program. And um, I think we'll just uh, say thank you.
we'll uh, hopefully see at our golf tournament and uh, we'll be putting this back up uh, on our website uh, and full content and also at our YouTube channel. So gentlemen, um, any, if you have any parting thoughts, I'm going to say thank you very much and uh, uh, go ahead with any parting thoughts and we'll end this, uh, ses this session. Thank you. Well, and a quick thank you from, from all of us at Bombardier to everybody that joined today. I hope, uh, hope you have a great weekend and we truly appreciate your time on a Friday afternoon. Excellent. Thank you all very much for attending. Uh, we wish you well. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks again, Jeremy. Thank you, Thanks Jeremy. for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you.